Perspectives, Finding Common Ground, a podcast series that brings together a panel of thought leader perspectives as a forum to socialize and problem solve education technology issues with the goal to ultimately find common ground. Hi, and welcome to this episode of Perspectives, Finding Common Ground, brought to you from the bet floor in England. So I'd like to start by introducing our panel. Our participants today. Uh, first, Mark Goldhawk is the assistant head, head of digital learning at Hawthorne School. Uh, Jennifer Surridge Paul is the head of IT and uh, digital at the Brit School. And Jason Wilmot is the head of Canva for education. So I'd like to start by having each of you spend a few moments talking about your perspective. We're going to be discussing today the challenges of selecting digital resources. And um, particularly appropriate here on the floor of BET with all the thousands of resources that are available, how do you pick the right ones? So um, we've got three different perspectives, uh, that of an IT uh, leader, that of a curriculum leader, and that of a uh, product that's used in the education space. So I'll start with you, um, Mark, and ask you to give us your perspective a little bit on how the process works and how it works for you today. Of course, yeah. I mean, as you touched upon, there are literally thousands of products out there. Um, and each of them are amazing. You go around, I mean, you walk around today and you see them and there's features of them. You're like, that's brilliant. I want to use that. Well, I was in one of the talks earlier and I think I think they hit the nail on the head. They said simplicity is key. Um, and it's finding products that have all these great facilities, these great resources, um, but ideally in one place, whether that's through one platform, which is rarely achievable, or through a way of bringing it all together so the children can access them easily, so the staff can access them easily. Um, and so it's simple to set up and simple to use. And I think, like I said, yeah, simplicity is key because staff need the training on these resources for them to be used effectively. And if you really want to have that value added from, from your purchase and you want to see what that is doing to improve children's progress, um, you're not going to be able to do it with hundreds of different resources. Um, you've got to channel that, that energy and that focus in a certain direction um, and, and to get the most out of it. So it, it can be a bit of a minefield um, and it's so tricky to know what is the right decision. Are you making the best decision here? Are there other products that I should be exploring? Um, and I think as a, I mean, I've seen it from both sides. So I, sort of start, I, I am a teacher, but I, I do a lot of sort of technical leave as well. And um, just having companies that, and products that work with each other makes life a lot easier. Um, and I know we've, we've been with Fastlink and that's really helped um, because it has brought people into one place and it means children can get into their, the different platforms that we use with simplicity. Um, so that's sort of, yeah, that's my perspective on it. Thanks. Thank you. Jennifer? Well, my perspective on it, just following on for what Marcus said, is the implementation process, making sure that strategically it's going to be right for the actual business and the business needs. So have we thought about our objectives? What's our end goal going to be? And have we involved all of the different stakeholders within the process? Or is it just the IT that have decided, OK, they want to purchase this? Or someone's gone to a wonderful conference such as that and said, this looks awesome, let's get it. But there's no thinking behind it. That is always an issue that we've got there. So my perspective is let's involve all of the different stakeholders. Let's have, have an action plan for this. But also with that roadmap through that implementation process, are we thinking with an agile process as well? Are we reviewing what we've got there? Or are we just saying, okay, that's it go ahead with that product, let's not review it as well. Let's not see that we are getting best value for it. Because I know in my experience, in my role, that has been the case that we don't have that product review. We want suppliers to think about it. And that's where I'm going from my perspective. Thank you. Jason? Yeah, I mean, from a vendor perspective, it's interesting to build on Mark and Jennifer's points because one of the core principles of Canva is to make complex things simple. And I think that is so true when you think about education. You have students of all ages. You have teachers of all different technical backgrounds. You have IT leaders. You have staff within schools. And meeting them where they're at is so important. And each one of them will have a different use case for a different platform. For example, 
in Canva, we have district leaders who need to create newsletters or school leaders who want to create a newsletter. It's not really relevant in some cases to a student. Sometimes it's relevant for a teacher, but how do we make complex things simple is something we are consistently thinking about. And then to build on Jennifer's point, we get teachers using our platform who will take us to IT, but they don't understand the technical integration. So they're like, how do we integrate Canva across the whole school? And so how do we as a vendor think about helping that teacher communicate more effectively with IT, communicate more effectively across the system? What are the learning outcomes we're going to, our objectives we're going to drive for the students? But then also, how are we going to help IT? How are we going to help the integration layer? You know, and I think uh, Mark said it perfectly with Classlink. It's how do, we, how do we have a single platform where we can surface Canva that everybody can access it with one click? get rid of passwords. We know that students don't remember passwords. I don't remember passwords. Um, and so really thinking about how we can be more effective across the entire system is something that's top of mind and should be top of mind for all vendors. This is wonderful because clearly we've captured three different perspectives <laughs> in this conversation, right? So um, kind of taking on that, let's, let's kind of go through the journey a little bit. And, and maybe we start with you, Mark. Let's talk a little bit when you're looking at curriculum. How are you evaluating that? And then, and then how do you take that to engage the other parts of the organization that need to be engaged? Do you know what? It's a really tricky one. Um, and it, it does have to start from not actually places like that. You have to identify what you want to improve in school. Um, it's all very well coming to, to bear and seeing these amazing products and from a, as a leader trying to force that upon the teachers in your school but they're not going to buy into it. You, you really have got to sell it to them. And the best way to do that is to identify the need and show how um, this tool can, can improve it. Um, and then you will actually get genuine buy-in from these teachers and genuine buy-in from students as well. So, and it, it is a tricky one. There's so many stakeholders to involve, um, whether it's financial, whether it is the IT team who ultimately have to manage it a lot of time, um, down to the teachers, what, what extra training do they need? Is it worth them investing that time learning how to use this tool or should they be focusing that time on something else that they'll get a better outcome from it so whenever we're looking at the, each of these different tools and even when we're evaluating the current tools that we've got it does have to go back to that initial question of what is the main purpose of using this why are we using it are we just using it for the sake of it and if that's the case then ultimately it has to go and we need to reinvest that money we need to reinvest the time finding a better product that, will fulfill our needs. Um, I, I, I love tech, but I don't want to use it just for the sake of it. It's, it you just won't get teachers in the Very well said. So Jennifer, do you have that kind of source of truth as well from a technology perspective? Like it's it's clear that instructionally there has to be a, a, a kind of a guiding light. Do you have a similar? Definitely. I mean, I'd like to echo exactly what Martha said. Um, it has to be a need for it. It has to be a tool that you're using for teaching and learning. And there needs to be a reason why we're using it. Is it going to be beneficial? Or is it a sake that, again, someone's gone to a conference like that thought this is great let's just implement it and haven't thought about okay is it going to be useful are the staff going to benefit from it so uh, have we got time to train the staff and what about their workload is it increasing their workload or is it going to actually decrease their workload is it going to save that time so we need to ask all of these questions before we're thinking about that implementation and i think vendors need to actually think about that as well they need to think, okay, is it going to be useful? And how are we selling this as well, this product, so it can be useful to our, student, our teachers and our students as well? It's really important. I think, Jason, there's, it's set up very nicely for you here. <laughs> so easy. Um, and, and, and as a vendor working with schools, I think that's, that's sometimes the challenge because you, you know, personalized learning is a real thing for each individual student. And teachers are at such a different point in their training. You know, I always like to say the 1% of those teachers could probably pick up any ed tool here at BET and be extremely proficient in it. But the other 99 need that training and they need that support. And whether that's coming from the vendor or it's coming from a teaching and learning staff on the campus, how do we train the trainer to be more effective and efficient? And then ultimately, I agree 110%. You can't just do technology for the sake of technology. A good analogy I'll give is when kind of the ebook came out and worksheets are in there. 
taking a physical worksheet and just making it digital is not really useful to anybody, right? How do we add, how does, you know, in Canvas perspective, how do we add visualization? How do we add where the students will be a little bit more excited and they're actually dragging and dropping and that interactivity and what does that look like? And so we, we believe that we have to actually think about that from a student and a teacher perspective and meet them where they're at. Because one of the great things about the best ed tech, pl ed tech platforms is if you can start at a base level of zero and within five minutes, go to a base level of five, but then as you get more proficient in that ed tech tool, you can become more proficient. And that's the greatest thing that I think ed tech vendors should be thinking about is how do we can get on a user, whether it's a student, teacher, staff member, and within five minutes, very little training, maybe they're at a level one in your product. But then as they get more proficient, your product can expand to meet their needs where it's not a tax on that teacher or student and they're getting more from it. They're, they're either improving their teaching, saving them time and improving learning outcomes, which is ultimately the most important thing. And it sounds like um, each school is going to have each school or each school organization is going to be slightly different. And, and how do you, is it clear to a vendor what the school is going to focus on or what's important to this uh, educational organization um, so that you can, in fact, uh, address it and cater to it and work towards it? Or is it is it a challenge to understand that sometimes? Yeah, I think sometimes it's a challenge. And I don't think it's not that it's not clear from the school perspective. I think sometimes it's a challenge where the individual user who found your tool, whether they were walking around BET or found your website, sometimes that individual user doesn't know their school or district or their system requirements. And so it ultimately is, and I think Jennifer was touching on this, is the collective group at the school, getting the curriculum, getting the IT, getting the individual teacher that loves your product together and selling the value as one. Otherwise, you're gonna have a lot of conversations and you're gonna have a group of teachers that you're talking to, a group, you know, and then when IT comes on them, I don't even know what you do and then you have to resell what you do. And so I think, you know, one of my, you know, the way I coach my team is bring in more people from the beginning because it's gonna save us as a vendor time, precious time, and also the school's time. Because otherwise, Mark's gonna jump on a call, I'm gonna tell him about the integrations, how to set it up, you know, set up his Active Directory, set up ClassLink, do all this. Then Jennifer's gonna get, I'm gonna have to resell to Jennifer on the teaching and learning side. Whereas if we have a collective call together, we can sell the collective value to the institution. So I think sometimes as vendors, we get confused and it's rightfully so because we're getting hit at a lot of different levels. But I think what we can do a better job of is just helping bring that person together. I've had a lot of conversations with teachers on the bet stand where I ask, is your IT person here? It's better if we just bring them in right now. Um, and if they're not, I will send you a mail to introduce us to your IT, at which point it's going to be a much easier conversation versus me spending hours upon hours with you as an individual teacher and then trying to bring it all back together to the school. It does definitely have to be a united front. Yeah as well for it to work. Yeah. Really I, think, I, mean, I think schools have got a part to play in this as well. I mean, my my role has changed over the last few years rapidly, but our IT manager was with me today as we were walking around. And as, as a head of digital learning, I almost have a foot in both doors because I see it from a teacher's perspective. But then I also share an office with many. We talk each day. And I understand the frustrations. And I think, I think schools have a part to play in this as well. And they need to they need to have someone on their team who can champion it and have an understanding of, of both sides of it and they might not be a, a technical lead they might be a teacher and they can sort of be brought into that technical team and, and understand what, what goes into it um and even having them as part of the leadership of the team as well means they're that that closer to having their voice heard and being on a leadership meeting and sharing their opinion and sharing these ideas just gets again that foot in the door for these things to take off and to be a success because they're constantly being brought up you're hearing different perspectives um and you're not going to implement it and then a year down the line cancel that subscription because it's not right um, so i think yes yeah, schools do have a part to play in that as well definitely just following on from that like strategically the person that's in charge of IT needs to be at the forefront of it because they're in charge of the strategic part of it and the operations so they need to have hands in both and that's the academic side of things and the administrative side of things but they also need to work directly with SLT principal to make sure that it's drip 
that you flip fed that from top to bottom as well and we're aware of the issues. I think it's brilliant that they put the head of the curriculum and head of technology in the same office. <laughs> <laughs> it's a busy office. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about the process a little bit. I mean, do you have, and I, I guess we'll start with you, Jennifer. Do you, is there a formal process in your school about how the selection is made? And I also, I would kind of have a corollary to that. Do you prepare when you send teachers to an event like that? Do you prepare them with some of those rules that they should follow or a process they should follow? So in my case, I mean, if I'm looking at a product that I want to get, I would involve all the different stakeholders. So first of all, I would make sure that, that I've done a survey to look at the analysis part of it to make sure that everyone wants this product. And then I would also identify different stakeholders, that being in admin, that being um, the curriculum as well, and make sure that we've got some champions to test out whatever system that we're going to have so we can find out if there's any teething problems that's going to be that part of things that that's part that I need to make sure that we've covered that. So I think that's really important that we have that process in place and that we're constantly reviewing it. But whatever we do, it needs to be in the school development plan. If it's not part of that school development plan, then we're not going to get anywhere with it. And that's really big. If you get an MIS, that needs to be part of the school objectives. And that's where your digital strategy comes into it. And everything underpins that as well. So when we know that it's on the school development plan, we know that everyone is going to be involved, whatever it is. It's not going to be just someone in the corner, such as IT, that decided they want to do this, or teachers decided in mass they want to flag this as well and want to push for it. Everyone's going to be involved as well. Great. Great. And how about you, Mark? Do you have a, a structured plan? <laughs> I would love to say it was very structured, but <laughs> it's, it's not wasting the time. Um, I think... A lot of it is spurred on by people's ideas and they you'll you'll have a teacher who's identified something they've identified a need for this tech tool um and they're looking to champion it and they're looking to implement it and oh yeah like i said i'd love to say it was a really structured conversation but it's, it's not most of the time um but as, as jennifer's touched upon having the stakeholders there is so important um even even down to the simple thing it's not a simple thing but how Keeper accounts are set up. Who's, who's responsible for that? Can it be in, can it be uh, automated? That that part is taken under control of each year. Um, because I've come across so many products where, if you look at it from a curriculum perspective, the teaching tools are fantastic. But from the technical side, it's a headache, and you have to manually roster them all. And there's there's no joined up thinking, and they've clearly invested a lot of their their development time into the teaching side, of it, which is how they're going to sell the product but the back end of it hasn't seen any any attention for a long time um so having those stakeholders there means that you can really pick apart the product and, and check off that it does meet all the different needs and it might not i think you can't rule out the tech tool because it doesn't tick all these boxes you have to sort of evaluate okay what, what's going to be the downside to this what extra work is that going to create how could we reduce something elsewhere so we can still deliver this and, and bring this tool in to make it work? Um, because not, not all of them are perfect. It would be great if one day they work. Um, I think the rate that things are improving, we might get to that stage C. Um, but you can't you can't rule out a product just because the IT team don't like it and equally vice versa. Um, it, it does have to be a discussion and you have to be able to bring it on. I think that's very interesting. I think that there, I've heard the word minefield. I've heard, you know, challenges come up. I think we'll, we'll bounce back to a couple of more of those. I do want to ask from your perspective, Jason, is there any, I think you mentioned that you would ask a teacher is your IT person here. Do you have any formal way that you try to coach or guide your staff to, to make sure that the right stakeholders are engaged and to, kind of check it off so we don't get so far down the path if we haven't got, if we don't have everybody we need to have it all. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, my team is ensuring that we're working with IT, the curriculum team, 
Um, and then typically the way Canva for Education works is we usually have a very large ground base of teachers that love us, which is awesome. Um, but when we do get approached by a group of teachers wanting connected to a school, we want to make sure that IT as well as curriculum is engaged. Now, um, Canva for Education is 100% free, but if you do have a paid product, at some point you may be looking at a procurement team you also need to bring in to make sure that you're ticking the boxes based on their procurement rules. Um, one of the things that's sometimes challenging from a vendor perspective is getting far down the pipe and then saying, oh, you actually need to uh, comply with this or comply with this. Because 99% of ed tech vendors do want to comply. We comply with GDPR. We comply with COPA and FERPA in the US. We are safe for students. But then there's additional language at every school. And so the standardization of that has been pretty much all over the place. But I think everybody, both the schools and the vendors, want to work to a common ground to keep all the ed tech tools safe for their students. And so how do we, how do we come to that common ground is something I would say that has been challenging as a vendor. But Absolutely, we're, we're engaging on the IT level, the curriculum level. Um, and then once again, on Canva for Education side, we have a huge ground cell of teachers already using our product just about every school in the world, um, which is awesome. I can't complain, but sometimes when they want to bring it to their IT or curriculum team, they haven't had that conversation. So we want to make sure we connect them. So data privacy and security has come up <laughs> now. And we talked about minefields. How appropriate. It's all this together. So... Um, I can imagine that from a technology perspective, data privacy and security is of the utmost importance. And not that it's not important from a curricular perspective, but how often do you find that a challenge when, when seeking out another product or looking at a product, um, the, the data privacy concerns are, are preventative from a it's, you know, I think you have to be pragmatic about it. I don't think... It, if you're working with these ed educational platforms, everyone's got the right intentions. They want to keep it safe. Um, very rarely, in fact, I don't think I've come across any platform where they've intentionally gone out to make it safe. They might not be aware of all the risks and they've got some things they've got to work on. Um, but if you think pragmatically about it and you don't suddenly say, no, that's not going to happen because of this, um, then it does mean that things can move forward. I mean, we do, you do have to see those boxes. Um, are they GDPR compliant? Um, we have looked at a couple of platforms in the past uh, based in the US, and they were GDPR compliant. And unfortunately, that does it's just stop there. Um, so it has it has stopped a couple of developments. But um, as long as they tick those boxes, and when you're engaging in those discussions with the vendor early on, and you're asking those right questions, and you get that information, then you're all going to be working together to make sure it's a safe platform for them to use. And things are improving over time as well. The, the, if you go to the vendor and you say, look, this is an issue, they, they tend to fix it quite quickly because they don't want schools to be putting out with their, their products as well. So everyone's working together to make sure these, these not the right phrase, but the, the, the children aren't kept safe and the privacy is, is very good. Okay, so we've heard that there's a challenge with um, security and compliance with security and the variation between the different schools or different regions and countries even. Um, can you think of anything, Jennifer, that you can do to help you or you might be able to do to help standardize that and, and normalize it a little bit so it's not as extreme in terms of vendors responding? So we're thinking about our backup as well. Where is the data going to be backed up? And what, one thing that we've actually done is actually moved away from on-premises to the cloud base, and that's been really helpful. Because then you're not having to upgrade that server, you're not thinking about that data, how you're going to protect that in case of any disaster recovery as well. You've got that in the cloud, but then you also need to think about, okay, have you got a backup for it being in the cloud as well? What are you using for that as well? But you don't, it takes it away from you having to worry about on-premises backing it up there so that's really helpful so i would think about making sure for vendors that they've got their data they've actually outlined how their data is going to be backed up i mean i don't know what canva does as well i'm sure that's going to be awesome yeah we i mean here at canva we have a uh, open data policy so you can see our data privacy agreement you can yeah. see all of our we actually have an educational section in it talks about how we handle educational data and i love what mark was saying about pragmatic because when you Canva operates in 190 countries. We're localized in 70, 80 different languages. It's, it's hard. And you know whether it's Egypt, the United States, whether it's London, 
they are slightly different. And as vendors who operate in so many countries, working with pragmatic customers is, is always the best because we can, we, we are doing the right things. And a, a, a good example in the United States is they have the national framework. Well, ISO certification is actually above the national framework in the US. You will have some customers in the US say, we well, have to comply to the national framework, but ISO is higher. And so it's like, where's the pragmatic, you know what, we gotta be pragmatic here. We're actually complying to a higher standard than what you're asking us to. And once again, 99.9% .9 of customers in the US are okay with that. But it, you know, from a vendor perspective, just making sure that we are open about our policies. And it's really nice when we have it all online, both our corporate policies, as well as our education policies, because we do handle data differently. You know, uh, an, an ed tech provider might be providing services to a consumer or to a corporation where maybe they're monetizing via advertising or other mechanisms. But in education, that is completely different. We are not monetizing in education via advertising. We're actually not monetizing in education at all. We monetize through our corporate and consumers. And so the business model of the company can all, oftentimes dictate how they're actually going to sell and what that looks like to a school. And that's a fantastic point. Um, Jennifer, let's, let's start with you on that. The business model, different companies have different models yeah. and they may be understood. They may not be understood. They may be considered or they may not be considered. Uh, how, how do you, how does that play a role in your selection process? So in terms of making sure that that company wants to do the best for education, like you've got Adobe, you've got Canva as well, and you can see that they offer a substantial discount for Adobe. I mean, with Canva, the fact that they're offering it is free, it's absolutely wonderful as well. It would make me want to actually use Canva and promote it as well, because this is a free product, just like what we had with Google as well. Yep. It was a free product. Everyone wanted to use it as well. Now they've gone through a paid subscription, so it's slightly different. But having that business model, I think, is absolutely brilliant. So it makes you think, okay, this company really wants to invest in education because they've got the corporate, they're getting their money through corporate, but they've decided with the education, they want to grow their product there. They want to see what education can do for them as well. So I'm really impressed with that. That's really good. That's something that I would say, okay, that is a company that I would like to look at. And that really does determine, okay, if they're giving away something free or if they're giving a discounted rate, that would be something that I would say, okay, I'd want to go with that company. Do you ever run into companies that say it's free, but then you find out later that that might not really be the case? Oh, no, I haven't had that. Because I'll make sure that I do all my research beforehand, <laughs> <laughs> thoroughly, so I'm not going to have any surprises. Good, good. Well, Sometimes get caught out with apps that you might use for children. It's free one day, and then six months later, it's paid for. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think the, the financial model, where the company actually makes their money, I, I do have to applaud Canva because their, their product is truly free to schools, and it's sponsored from their business side of the organization. You have some others that will will promote a product as free and they'll use advertising and they'll use other hidden measures to actually recover uh, the, the money they need to make. And, and I think it's a little bit misleading. So I'm glad to hear that you don't, you don't run into that. No. I probably is because of your diligence if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Does that ever run into, you know, from the curriculum side of things, you've got teachers that get enthralled with something and, and they come back and say, hey, we want to use this, this is great. You do, you do, and you. The challenge is not, it's not sort of squashing their enthusiasm because they they want to use it and they 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 have the right intentions of using it. But this is where we go back to what we were saying at the start about evaluating these products, and it might be great to go, yes, let's do that. But have you checked everything thoroughly? Checking all the things that you're checking for the privacy and security of it. Um, Sometimes you do just have to take the place down a little bit. So, okay, we need to do our, our due diligence first and make sure it is safe and, and easy to use. Um, and I mean, when we just when we implemented classing, I just want to touch on that. When we implemented classing, a lot of it tied into that process was evaluating all the apps and the platforms that we used at the same time. So not only were we trying to simplify it and give children access we can click into it we were looking at what we had and actually we found a couple of platforms that we weren't aware of we were able to shut those down or bring them on, onto classing um, 
so yeah, sometimes you do you do have to rein it in a little bit. Um, but more often than not, you then come to a resolution and go, yeah, that's great, we're good to go with it. Or you might have to say, oh, actually, we've got a product that does that already, we haven't tried this. Um, yeah, it's just like those limitations. In, in, to both of the school leaders here, how much energy do you spend with your peers and other school organizations kind of checking notes, so to speak, on what's good? Because the process of refining your app list sounds like you relied on a partner to help you last link to help remember that song but do you how much do you rely on your your neighbors and your your peers i would like to do more i would like definitely like to work with other schools in our area um a lot more i think covid has, has made it challenging more for the time you just haven't got the time more that you haven't had the ability to go and visit these other schools and talk to them um but i mean every school does it differently so it is really hard to to find out what they're using will work for your school and you just have to pick elements of it Yes, you've got you know, all your Google schools and okay, that's, that's their fundamentals, but what other tools are they using? Um, and it might work for them, doesn't necessarily mean it will work for you. Um, but I would certainly love to do more of that and, and talk to other, to other colleagues in other schools and do things like this is really useful because it just shares those ideas. So, I mean, I really enjoy the fact that we're part of an LGFL schools and that means that we can actually collaborate with different schools meet different people at um, strategy meetings as well that's really important previous to this i used when i was in egypt i used to collaborate with different schools that were there host meetings and then also i used to do borough meetings that was really useful is speaking to the it leads within the borough and hosting those meetings working on a project that might be such as the mis or rolling out a curriculum like the computing curriculum what the benefits are going to be for the school and how we're going to implement that the different software hardware that we're going to need to do that because you've gone from a traditional classroom where it might be just a few computers you're going to then need to set up a computer lab itself so you, it's like a science based lab that you've got so it's working together deciding on different vendors as well that you've got their experience that's always very interesting so i think it's really important having those network meetings well and i can say jason from the class link perspective to, to throw the time uh, um Collaboration between companies, I think, is pretty pretty relevant, pretty regular. Um, and, and I will certainly appreciate your partnership, but do you have any additional thoughts on that? Absolutely. And I think it goes back to one of the original comments, either from Mark or Jennifer, is I mean, there's no one size fit all application. There's just not. You have, you know, multiple grade levels, multiple subjects, uh, multiple learning areas for students, depending on where they're at. So, from a vendor perspective, we're consistently working with other partners to try to find collaboration and get creative on how we can better support students and teachers. And sometimes that means a full integration. Other that times, that's like, how do we roster with ClassLink just to make sure that the rostering's easier in Canva for an IT department. We're not a rostering solution, we're a creativity solution. Um, and then sometimes teachers are really good at app smashing. They take two apps and they work them together um, and vendors learn from that. And so even though you think somebody may be competitive to you, they're often not in ed tech. And I can, I can honestly say that I've been in ed tech for my whole career and worked at Microsoft for 17 years. And really the best collaborations are people that think like you, look like you, are somewhat creative like you, and then you figure out the best way from a company perspective to support the school, the teacher, the student, um, and you will see some amazing partnerships come from events like this with other partners. Very, very well said. I want to I want to bring this back. We're, we're, we're reaching close to the end of our time, so I want to ask just one final question of each of you, and that is, if you had to pick one challenge, what is the biggest challenge that you think there is in this process of selecting data resources? Um, back, why, when, why I said the start, simplicity, um, having a, a simple platform that works with other platforms, um, people can access with ease, it's not going to take them forever to, to learn how to use it. That's the biggest challenge. For me, it'd be training, making sure that the end user has that training consistently throughout, not just one time. 
at all. It needs to be throughout the whole process and afterwards as well. And having that support from the vendor, that's one of the biggest challenges that I feel. Great, great. I mean, from a vendor perspective, I, I wouldn't call anything a challenge. We're, we're here to support the students, the teachers. And I think from our perspective, we just need to be better about helping a teacher who loves our solution, bring in the right people and make sure that we're consistently helping the schools proliferate the usage of an application if it, if it fits, if it fits their needs and making sure it's raising awareness across the school and bringing in those right people from the start. So we don't find ourselves weeks into a conversation and we haven't talked to the IT director or haven't talked to curriculum. So really, I think that's what the vendors need to do a better job of. Great. Well, I certainly appreciate everybody's comments here. I want to I want to summarize a little bit from what I've got, and then I'll have, I'll, I'll have you guys tell me if I've gotten it wrong, okay? I, I think one of the things that's come out of this loud and clear is that all the stakeholders need to be involved as early as possible in the process. They need to be aware. And a continuity in the personnel and the history of what's taken place is going to help and pay off in spades. You know, it, it will really make the whole process easier and involve the people early. Minimum requirements need to be established and kind of shared. So, and so the, this is basically setting the expectations. And many times that could be done with a rubric and a rubric that could be created within the or, your educational organization and potentially shared with vendors as a way to establish and facilitate the communication that's necessary. Um, and, and, and possibly even involving the vendors in the creation of that rubric. Things like um, uh, compliance with data privacy and security, we understand that there's a national level that's above the state level or, or local level that, that it can satisfy. That, that helps take bumps out of the road. And then I think, I think finally, anything that's done on the front end to make the selection process easier is going to pay off in spades down the road, not just in the selection of new products, but in the continued refinement and use of products that we have to capture it all? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> great, great. Well, I very much appreciate your time. You've been wonderful to talk to, very enlightening, and uh, certainly look forward to, to hearing more from you in time to come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. ClassLink is proud to be the meeting place to facilitate these conversations. If you have a topic idea, Send it to perspectives at classlink.com. To keep hearing our perspectives, be sure to follow us on Apple and Spotify and subscribe to us on YouTube.